Recording starts just in time for the uh, the big reveal. Um, but the the big reveal is the Woodmax study has found that Alaska LNG is a cost competitive project, and its cost of supply of LNG delivered to Asia is actually lower than uh, LNG delivered from the U.S. Gulf Coast. And the U.S. Gulf Coast was used because it, it's seen as kind of the marginal supplier of LNG in the world. Uh, we don't expect that Alaska LNG can compete against Qatar. We don't need to in cost competitiveness, but what we can do is deliver LNG at a cost lower than market prices, um, which is great. So they calculated a cost of supply at $6 and 70 cents uh, compared to, you know, anywhere from 750 to $8 for uh, compete projects from the U S Gulf coast. And so to the next question we usually get is that that's great. You know, how, how have you managed to reduce costs by 43%? And you know, part of it is we've managed to reduce the capital cost estimate. At the time of the 2016 Woodmac report, it was estimated that the project would cost anywhere between 45 and 65 billion dollars. Uh, we've since refined and reduced that to a 38.7 billion dollar capital cost uh, in 2019 dollars. Um, that's largely by taking advantage of changes in the LNG industry uh, with regard to modularized building. Um, but the big, the big driver in the reduction of the cost of supply is a transition to uh, what we call a tolling model, which can be underpinned by project financing. So when the producers were developing the, the project, and up until about 2016, most all LNG projects in the world, including the Kenai LNG plant, uh, had been developed by large IOCs, uh, independent oil companies. Um, essentially, their stakeholders, like the uh, risk and reward exposure of a typical oil company, which is uh, exposure to commodity prices. So for you know, 50 years, LNG had historically been priced uh, indexed to Brent crude. Uh, so you know, it'd be something like 14% of Brent crude plus 50 cents would be the price of LNG. So when oil prices go up, the LNG producers, oil companies make more money and that's what their investors like. Uh, but because of you know, the, the kind of the investor makeup of oil companies, they have a high expected rate of return. Uh, so, you know, in the 14% plus uh, is what they'd expect. So for a 45 to $65 billion project at the time to be financed and owned by the oil companies, Conoco, Exxon, and BP, uh, it expected to have to earn this really high rate of return. And that's, you know, with a, such a capital intensive project, that is what drove that high, you know, almost $12 cost supply to Asia. When we've since moved to a, what we call a tolling model, um, you know, kind of a little bit of, I, I, I like telling this with a little bit of a history lesson, right? So for, for years and years, uh, pipelines have been developed with a tolling model um, and it's, it's been common business practice. And what that tolling model allows it to do is reduce the cost of those pipelines as low as possible. So a pipeline developer will go out and find customers for the pipeline and those customers will sign up for a take or pay contract uh, for a long period of time, say 20 years. Uh, and that pipeline developer can go to a bank or go to financial institutions and get low cost debt for you know anywhere up to 70, 75% of the cost of the project. And then the pipeline developer would put in its own equity for the remaining 25%. Um, and the revenues to that pipeline company would be guaranteed through those take or pay contracts. And investors in the pipeline companies expect a low rate of return with very little risk exposure. So that's how for years pipelines have been built with a, a low cost of supply and low cost to use the pipe. Well, um, in back, you know, 20 or 10, 15 years ago, uh, natural gas prices in the lower 48 in the Henry Hub, you know, market uh, were quite high before the shale revolution. And a number of, of companies actually built LNG import facilities in the U.S. Gulf Coast to bring LNG into the United States because at the time LNG was cheaper uh, than U.S. natural gas. So what they did is they applied that same pipeline model to those LNG import facilities. Uh, so essentially they talked to customers, LNG buyers, and essentially the LNG import facility was connected directly to the pipe. So it made a lot of sense. 
Uh, so LNG or natural gas buyers in the United States signed up for long-term take or pay contracts uh, with those LNG import facilities. And they were financed again with low cost project financing. And then a few years went by and the shell revolution happened and uh, US natural gas prices uh, you know, decreased dramatically to the point where it was no longer economic to import LNG. Uh, but again, it, was, it became economic to potentially export LNG. So the owners of these LNG import facilities operate under a tolling model thought, you know, hey, I think we could probably sell LNG under the same sort of tolling model. Uh, and they went to the, the LNG buyer markets with this proposal, you know, a couple, you know, companies, Chenier and Freeport LNG, Sharif Suki and, and, and Michael Smith were kind of the leaders in this thought. And they discovered that LNG buyers were very much interested in buying LNG under a tolling model. So essentially they'd buy LNG and pay uh, the LNG owners uh, or LNG developers, a take or pay contract to pay for the cost of the liquefaction plant, plus the cost of procuring gas. So you'd have, you know, $2 and 50 cents or so plus Henry hub would be the price of LNG at the outlet of the plant. So for the first time, I'm going to jump to this next slide. So for the first time, starting about 2016, the first LNG was sold under this tolling model uh, in the U S Gulf coast. And that was about the same time the report came out, the Woodmac report saying, hey, your cost of supply under the traditional LNG model owned by IOCs is $11.50. It's way out of the market. But they actually suggested that we look at moving to a tolling model and identified it as a major cost saving at the time. But really it was in 2016, proven in pipelines, but really kind of unproven in LNG. Since that time in 2016, uh, there's been almost, the unit we use is 80 million metric tons for comparison, Alaska LNG is 20 million metric tons, but over 80 million metric tons of LNG capacity built in the United States under this tolling model. And the U.S. Uh, starting last December has become the world's largest exporter of LNG. Uh, so, you know, really it's, you know, the, the cost savings driven by switching from a producer-led model to a tolling-led model with uh, infrastructure developers it's, uh, it, you know, at first look, it kind of feels like, oh, you know, AGDC just kind of changed some numbers around, changed the model. What did they actually do? Uh, but really, we're just playing copycats, right? We're, we're seeing what U.S. Gulf Coast developers have been able to do. Um, and we're just applying that same business model and have been able, because we're so capital intensive, take our costs of supply from about eleven fifty down to $6.70. Uh, so with that, you know, development, we, we very much are an economic project. Um, and, you know, the, the, the process we're going now, you know, develop to, or transition over to private um, investors um, should be able to, you know, unlock that and pull that forward. But before I kind of go into that, the kind of our process of transitioning to private developers from state ownership, I do kind of want to stop and, and take, take a chance to answer any questions anyone has. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm hoping there's some still skepticism on our cost of supply that, that we can address. Great. Nick, could you uh, could you go ahead and explain a little bit more about the tolling process my model? Uh, I'm yeah. not familiar with that, and I, I I mean you kind of went through it, and, but models can always change numbers, I guess you could say. And uh, I just like a little more information on what that process is. Yeah, no, that'd be great. So, um, for example, uh, in the U.S. Gulf Coast, we'll use a Freeport LNG as an example. Uh, so. In the LNG contract sold out of the Gulf Coast, it's either a tolling model or they call it a capacity charge. Really, it's the same. Uh, they require the LNG buyer to enter into a long-term take-or-pay contract to pay that toll or capacity charge, say $2.50, uh, regardless of what happens to the price of Henry Hub, regardless what happens to the price of LNG, and regardless if they even buy any LNG. Uh, so, uh, for example, in 2022 or 2020, uh, when everyone remembers when oil prices went negative. Well, LNG prices didn't go negative, but they went very low too, and LNG demand dried up. So a couple of the plants like Freeport, for example, um, didn't sell all of its LNG in spring of 2022, but they were still getting paid. They're, you know, despite not actually selling LNG in their contracts, the customer's not taking LNG, they continue to pay Freeport LNG. Um, and that kind of take or pay model you know, that, that the, you know, the Freeport and all the other developers knew that they'd get paid, you know, no matter what happened in the market, allows them to unlock low cost debt, you know, in the, you know, for up to maybe 70, 75% of the project 
as well as attract low cost equity too. So investors that would be except maybe say a 12% rate of return versus a you know 16 plus for an oil company that has a lot more risk. Um, so essentially the Alaska LNG model is we'd be looking to LNG customers to enter into 20 year take or pay contracts uh, and pledge their balance sheet to underpin those contracts. And we could take those long-term contracts with credit worthy buyers and take them to the bank and essentially say, you know, please lend against this project. If you know anything happens to the LNG market, they're gonna continue to pay and, and they've pledged their balance sheet to it. Um, so that, that allows us to reduce the cost of supply. Okay, um, Nick, uh, we have a question from Jim Palmer. Can you comment on the federal guarantees which were passed a few years ago? Yeah, so um, let me close this window. So uh, the federal loan guarantee was passed, shoot, I don't know how long ago, the original one it was passed or put in by Ted Stevens and it applied to a natural gas pipeline from Alaska to the lower 48. Uh, in the recent infrastructure bill, uh, Lisa Murkowski was able to get language that applied the uh, loan guarantee to Alaska LNG. So I'm going to put up a slide again. Uh, so I love this question because it gives me the opportunity to say this. The full faith and credit of the United States will be pledged to pay the principal and interest on $26.3 billion of Alaska LNG event in the, in the event of a default, um, which is great. We have a piece of paper signed by President Joe Biden that pledges the full faith and credit of the United States government up to $26 billion for this specific project, um, which does a number of things. One, it, it helps with the cost of supply. Um, it, it lowers our cost of debt. Uh, we could potentially take on longer debt terms, which makes our annual payments lower. Uh, so it's great for the economics, um, but it's also really great, I think, politically and in order to de-risk the project because it gets it brings in the full support of, of the federal government. We've all seen other energy projects and other pipeline projects uh, that run into problems when the federal government, you know, maybe there's a administration, administration change and they pull support and, and cause, you know, major headwinds. Uh, we, we feel like this majorly de-risked the projects, not just for the federal loan guarantee, but for that federal support and that federal loan, uh, the federal uh, skin in the game. So you can see in here, we've, we've you know, had analysis by, you know, we've done our own internal analysis, what this could do to the cost of supply. Uh, Goldman Sachs has provided us analysis and Woodmac, I think also took a, uh, uh, took a crack at the, the impact on cost of supply. And we all expect that it could be anywhere from, you know, 25 cents to maybe even up to a dollar reduction in the cost of supply, which could either be passed on to our LNG customers to make us more appealing uh, or to, uh, increase the potential revenues to the investors in the state of Alaska and producers. So um, Nick, with, with the federal loan guarantee, um, what are you hearing from, I mean, or what are you hearing from your potential partners or are, uh, I mean, my expectation would be that this has really heated up conversations and that um, obviously with this, uh, lowering of risk and uh, changing of overall costs that um, it would have to essentially rework not only the finances, but the timelines for the project. Yeah, it, um, I guess what I would, you know, at first I'd kind of like to kind of provide a little overview on what we're doing commercially and then, and then kind of address how that's, how that's changed the conversation or improved it. Um, I'm going to find, I can find this slide here. Um, so, again, the history lesson, this was led by the producers up through 2016, and it just didn't quite work because of, of the cost of, of capital. The state led it for a while, um, which kind of was able to move to a tolling model, but really it struggled because the state, uh, we're, you know, AGC, you know, I love working here, but we're not qualified to build a, a LNG plant. Uh, so now we're looking to bring in qualified developers to, uh, you know, infrastructure developers to take over each piece of the project. We have a pipeline company um, on board to do the pipeline. And right now we are laser focused on identifying an LNG, what we call an LNG lead party. So this would be the company that would come in and take over and own the pipeline portion of the project. Uh, and we're finding through our conversations, we kind of started with the entire universe of companies that built LNG projects. Um, and we've kind of laser focused it into those companies that generally are operating the U.S. Gulf Coast, 
because they use that tolling model and it works really well in Alaska. Uh, and there's only a number of them. Uh, so, you know, this isn't necessarily an exercise of, you know, post it online and see who can come in and offer the most, you know, money to take it over. Instead, it's kind of like a long dating process to find the right fit. It's such a large, important project that, that we're really working through it deliberately. Um, so in terms of how this has changed the conversation, you know, we are not actively out trying to sell LNG. Uh, we expect that LNG lead party would take the lead on that when they come in. Uh, we have regular uh, kind of, I, I guess I would say, update calls with the major LNG buyers. We've kind of high graded the ones we've spoken to in the past and continue to provide them updates on the project. And they all find it, uh, the federal loan guarantee um, as, as, as very good news. And partially for the cost of supply and partially just to see that the Biden administration um, is willing to back this project with $26 billion. Um, in terms of the developers that we're talking to, they also see this as, as you know, maybe they're more focused on the impacts of the economics and, and to their, their potential revenue from the project, but they also see it as a great vote of confidence. Um, so, you know, we've been making a, a number of trips to, to Houston over the last few months, having, you know, direct face-to-face -face meetings with these companies and talking through how we might engage each one of them. Uh, we've been working closely with the North Slope producers, uh, Hillcorp, ConocoPhillips, and, and ExxonMobil. And I feel like, you know, if there's been any relationship that has, has dramatically improved over the last, I would say, year, it's with the producers. Um, because of this federal loan guarantee and because of this new business model we're taking of bringing in private developers, uh, I think they're getting a lot of confidence that their role in the project will be to just sell gas. That, you know, the, the ask going forward is going to be for them to be gas sellers, not come back in and lead the project. Um, this Wood Mac study really shows how the project economics really improved moving from producer ownership to developer ownership. Um, and I also say that the relationship we have with policymakers, the state of Alaska, uh, has dramatically improved as this Woodmax city has come out and clearly shown that the private investments and developers um, are, you know, it's an economic project and we won't be going to the state of Alaska asking for a major subsidy or asking for, you know, them to, you know, all of a sudden be on the hook for a major cost overrun. I think they've, you know, this has demonstrated and provided a lot of uh, goodwill with the policymakers of exactly what our ask is. And that is for the state to you know, continue to support the project, um, but we won't be coming and asking for a big subsidy. We will um, strongly preserve their right to own 25% of the project and all of our developers and investors understand that and they welcome it. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's a combination of this transition to the tolling model and the Woodmax study and the federal loan guarantee um, has really, really improved not just the interest, but the relationships with the, those major stakeholders. Well, um, Jim Palmer's back with a follow-up question, and, yeah. and, and this is uh, something else in the mix. Uh, certainly, um, we're seeing an, an uh, intensifying of um, uh, corporate um, redlining of oil and gas investment in the Arctic and increased uh, pressure on um, environmental, social, and governance uh, standards for um, uh, private companies. So how, uh, how are those uh, uh, trends within financial markets influencing the project and the conversations that you're having? Great question. So I, I would say that it's impacting us in kind of two different levels and one's a lot more important than the other. The, the higher level where we have a negative impact is, you know, where, you know, redlining almost is kind of a word. You know, people say they're not gonna do Arctic oil and gas. And that's kind of the, the big statements and that kind of gets political. What we're seeing is that the, the serious financial institutions um, are taking a very strong ESG approach, but they're taking it on a project by project basis. Mm -hmm. That, and they see Alaska LNG as having a very strong and very credible ESG component to it. And that matters a lot more to them uh, than the fact that you know, Alaska is an Arctic state and that our gas comes from the Arctic. Uh, it's more important what the, the impact of this specific project will do. So I keep, I keep pulling off, actually, I don't need to share this. So, you know, two things have come out of this, uh, uh, kind of this recent ESG push. One of them is uh, we had our export license challenged by I think Center for Biologic Diversity and Sierra Club. Mm -hmm. and, and they said that, you know, we need to look at, or, or the regulators need to look at the full life cycle analysis and impact of a greenhouse gas impact of Alaska LNG. So we did, 
and our LNG, you know, will be sold in Asia and largely be used to offset coal production or coal consumption. Uh, is which, and we continue to see new coal plants being built in China, and it's, it's we will be offsetting coal. There's no, you know, hand waving around that. That's the reality. And natural gas, when burned, uh, offsets or emits about half the greenhouse gas emissions as coal does. So we look from the very production all the way down to combustion in Asia and compared it to, you know, kind of the status quo of burning coal and saw that we would reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions by about 77 million tons per year, which is about, you know, half the emissions of, of burning coal. So just by the size of our project, um, you know, even though it's not green, it's not carbon neutral, if reducing it by half and reducing so many uh, by half, it has the equivalent of shutting down 19 coal power plants or constructing 16,000 wind turbines. Um, so, you know, I, I can't necessarily verify because I haven't done everything, but I some, sometimes like to say that this project could have the la largest uh, greenhouse gas benefit of any project being considered right now. And that's probably true other than, you know, maybe a, another Three Gorges Dam or, you know, a massive multiple nuclear projects. Great. Bernie, did you have something? Uh, yeah, I'd like to follow up that with Nick. Uh, you know, FERC just... Uh, uh, voted yesterday, I think it was, uh, to give more weight to environmental concerns over natural gas pipelines uh, projects uh, when they're developing, uh, whether they're going to give the okay. And I noticed on your first slide, you had um, a statement that says uh, environmental was a big concern of yours, and you just kind of filled it out uh, with uh, what you could do with uh, the green gas. Could you Talk a little bit more about what FERC did, just did, or or you were aware aware of that, and that I'm, might have I'm, came I'm, out this morning. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm aware. Our, our, I mean, we have like like I said, we're a lean team, but we've got just awesome, awesome uh, team on regulatory being led by Lisa Haas. Um, so she gave us an update as soon as that came out. I can't speak to it. I'm not a regulatory expert. I don't want to say anything on it, something that's being recorded that's not. You know, so we're very, very careful with our, with our first license. We won't tell anyone, Nick. <laughs> no, no, no. We, we, like, it, it's, it's, there's nothing hidden or secret. I just trust Lisa to, to cover the regulatory stuff because she's so good at it and I don't do it justice. Um, but kind of my takeaway was um, the first, the changes at first will, will probably make it harder to license new projects in the future. Uh -huh. And I think if anything, it makes our existing FERC license all the more valuable. Okay, that's kind of the way I looked at it too, yeah. because uh, you've already went through the a little process there. And there, so anyway, thank you for the update. very large process. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and one other thing I, I I love to kind of touch on if we're talking about the ESG story, um, something that you know almost by by accident that we stumbled into with this project is. So I took a little. I've been with this project since 2017, uh, January 2017, and took a bit of a sabbatical. A year ago, and then when I came back in November of 2020, um, you know, the, the AGV team was talking about hydrogen, producing clean hydrogen, blue hydrogen from Alaska. And you know, my first thought was like, you know, like let that go. We need to focus on LNG. We don't have big enough staff to be doing extra stuff. And then very quickly, you know, all the major LNG buyers are specifically in Japan are becoming very focused on securing carbon neutral energy in the future, hydrogen or hydrogen in the form of ammonia. So we started looking at the potential of supplying clean hydrogen uh, or clean ammonia uh, from the Alaska LNG project. And what we discovered, so the, the process for clean, I'll, I'll put a quick slide up here. Um, so the process for clean, oops, creating clean hydrogen is, uh, actually I guess I don't have a good slide showing it. So essentially, you can create clean hydrogen two different ways. One was through electrolysis and renewable energy, where you take renewable electricity and you run it through what's called an electrolyzer, and hydrogen comes out the other end. Or you can use what's called methane reforming, where you take natural gas and you split the methane into a hydrogen and a CO2 stream. And if you take that CO2 stream and sequester it underground permanently, you, the resulting uh, hydrogen is, is, is clean and it's carbon neutral. So in order to produce that sort of, of uh, clean hydrogen, you need a carbon sequestration basin. And it just so turns out that the, the same uh, natural gas fields that pr produce the natural gas for the keen LNG plant and the coal seams that produce the natural gas has been identified as the best carbon sequestration potential on the Pacific coast of North America. Um, 
I'm going to pull my screen down again. Sorry if I keep going back and forth on the screen. Um, so, and then in addition, our, our, you know, the greenhouse gas study showed that we have one of the lowest carbon intensity sources of greenhouse gas in the world. And we have an ammonia plant. The nutrient plant, the old agrium plant, produces ammonia, which is how uh, Japan is looking to import hydrogen in the form of ammonia. You take the, you produce the hydrogen and you can turn the hydrogen back into ammonia. And that ammonia is a clean burning fuel with no carbon emissions, or it can be turned back into hydrogen in Japan. Um, in addition, uh, transporting hydrogen or ammonia is going to expect to be a bit more expensive on a per unit basis uh, than LNG. So our short shipping distance to Japan is another advantage. So we have, you know, a couple of guys, you know, small team over here pushing, you know, the world's largest LNG project discovered that we also have one of the best clean hydrogen uh, potential projects in the world as well. Uh, so, you know, the hydrogen market is, clean hydrogen market is kind of doesn't exist right now. And we don't expect it to be very large for decades to come. Uh, but with the existing ammonia plant there, there's the potential to, as when we start Alaska LNG, to also start, uh, restart that ammonia plant and be one of the first commercial scale uh, blue ammonia projects in the world supplying uh, Asia. So we're working closely you know, with different Asian companies and we're looking at federal opportunities in the infrastructure bill. There's $8 billion for hydrogen hubs. Uh, so we're exploring that as well. But what that allows us to do is, um, you know, Alaska has decades, generations of natural gas supply in the North Slope. And the energy transition by all accounts is real. And LNG, because it offsets coal, we expect it to be used for, for decades to come. But there is a limited life potentially for those hydrocarbons. Or there's the risk that, you know, maybe 20, 30 years from now, um, LNG isn't the preferred fuel. But by having this, this, uh, clean hydrogen transition story, a credible story. Uh, it allows us to go to potential investors and say, yes, this is a fossil fuel project. Yes, it'll, you know, LNG is good for now. It's a good transition fuel, but it almost, it, what we call future proofs it. Um, and it, another way of thinking of future proofing is it de risks us for our investors. And I tell you what, having a great ESG story and a great credible energy transition story uh, makes it way easier to raise $40 billion for an energy project in 2022. It's much more important than it would have been just two, three years ago. Yeah, and interesting. In in terms of the uh, sequestration basin, is that is that in Cook Inlet? Is that on the Cook, West Forelands of Cook Inlet? Yep. Yeah. So it's it's within Cook Inlet. There was a study done by West Carb, which is um, I think it was led by a, a coalition of Western states with California kind of driving it. Mm -hmm. uh, done in 2011. Mm -hmm. um, that that looked at the kind of one the existing gas reservoirs that the gas came from, as well as the coal seams that produce the gas mm -hmm. and uh, saline aquifers and just identified, you know, within the Cook Inlet area, just massive sequestration potential. This is this is an old, old story, but I remember the former MMS had a, a scenario looking at um, silica structures, cations over on the Alaska Peninsula and uh, just talking about the potential of using those um, as sequestration basins for, oh, um, yeah. And, and it, anyway, it was, uh, it was actually, I mean, that was more than 20 years ago, but, and, and the case study that they had developed was maybe 20 or 30 years old, even at that, at that point, but it was remar quite remarkable looking back on it, that, that, that scenario had been uh, developed at that time. So Hey, uh, Nick, we have another, we have a question from Jim Strandberg, um, and you may have addressed this when you were talking about um, what the displacement rate would be for other carbon projects and coal projects, but um, uh, how does uh, the CO2 content from the North Slope gas figure into the environmental equation for the project? Good question. So uh, North Slope gas, specifically Prudhoe Bay, has uh, remarkably high CO2 content. I think it's 12 or 14% of CO2, uh, where in Cook Inlet, it's almost zero. Um, Point Thompson's a bit lower, maybe 4%. Uh, so part of the project is a gas treatment plant on the North Slope that'll be located in Prudhoe Bay. And what that plant will do is remove the CO2 from the natural gas stream. Uh, it's critical that there is no CO2 in the natural gas because uh, if you send CO2 through an LNG plant, um, I forget, it, I think it essentially turns into dry ice, uh, which clogs everything up. So Regardless for environmental reasons, all the CO2 needs to be stripped out of the natural gas for, for LNG projects. So what we do, what's in our FERC license and, and required of the project is to re remove that CO2 on the North Slope. And we plan to re-inject it 
uh, into the North Slope or to, into, into Prudhoe Bay. I think the, the base plan is into a uh, portion of Prudhoe Bay called Eileen West End, uh, which is a part of the field which you could put the CO2, but it wouldn't communicate with the rest of the field and you wouldn't create, you know, put more and more CO2 into the gas stream. Uh, so the, the expectation or the action, not even the expectation, the requirement is that that CO2 is removed on the North Slope and injected into, into Prudhoe Bay. Uh, well, I'll just put another call out to the audience. Again, you can turn on your camera or you can put your uh, qu qu questions into the chat window and I'll uh, transmit those to Nick. Or you can turn on your camera and I'll call on you to open your mic and ask your questions. So Nick, um, what what's the focus? Oh, I see Ralph asking. Here, Ralph turning on his question, the camera. Ralph, go ahead. So it, it, it seems to me that the the key issue is getting 20 year take or pay contracts. Uh, that that's what the project needs to occur. That is, if somebody's willing to commit to 20 years, you think investors will take the other 10 years of risk because uh, you're specking the 30 year project, I think. Uh, so what, one question is how big, what percentage of the world's take or pay contracts would this represent if we put it on, if it was out today, just to give it a scale, and what's the uh, uh, the pro? I mean, obviously, it's it's not up to uh, the development company to do that. It's up to the private investor to do it. But what's what's the prognosis on that? Great question. Thanks, Ralph. Um, so right now, we are not, you know, we're not targeting LNG sales contracts. Uh, the project will need them, but in terms of sequence. Uh, we would expect that the LNG lead party, the LNG company that comes in and takes over the LNG plant, they'd want to drive their and, and negotiate their own LNG sales contracts. Uh, so we're waiting for that company to, to come in and sit at that table, at, uh, or that chair at the table um, before we continue to advance the LNG sales contracts. Uh, but we, at one point, um, under kind of the prior effort, had a very kind of aggressive LNG marketing effort. And we had LOIs, preliminary agreements with, I think, maybe a dozen or more of the major LNG buyers in the world. And, uh, you know, everyone kind of rolls their eyes at LOIs and, and, and says they're, they're not valuable. And it's true. I mean, you can't, they're, they're, they're not incredibly valuable, but they are a necessary first step. Uh, so I don't want to put too much weight into them, but I also don't want to discount them. But uh, so right now we're not actively talking with, with we're not, we're, we're sorry, we're that we are actively talking with the LNG buyers. But what we're telling them is we want to sell to you. We want to sell on a long-term contract. We're not going to ask you to sign the next level of agreement now. We're going to go find the LNG lead party, and then we're going to ask you to. And, and they all really appreciate that. They all think that's the correct timing. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen because there is one slide in here that I think would be helpful for asking kind of another important part of your question, which is kind of the size of the project related to the LNG market. So. This slide doesn't necessarily show the, the take or pay market. It shows the total LNG market. Um, but most of it is driven by long-term take or pay contracts, only a smaller portion of it's on, on spot contracts. So the bottom blue chart is the um, liquefaction capacity that's either in existence or under construction. And you can see it kind of declines over time because some of the fields that feed these LNG projects do deplete. And the, the lines on top are two different forecasts. Uh, one, kind of the more, the higher one, forecasts uh, kind of a, a slower energy transition, kind of a base case energy transition. And the green one represents kind of the, the most aggressive energy transition where we move away from fossil fuels. Both of them show a doubling of the LNG demand in the next 40 or 20 years. In, in terms of, you know, kind of quick side notes, LNG can be frustrating because it uses all sorts of different units. So in terms of LNG production, they use metric tons per year. Um, and our project is a 20 million metric ton project. And you can see the current market is about 450, 500 million metric tons, looking to double or close to double up to 800, 850. So our 20 million metric ton project is a large project, um, but it's not going to you know, disrupt the market. It's, it'll be just a fraction of what the, the expected market growth to be. So you know, with that, I think that, you know, showing a cost of supply under market prices, as well as showing that our project can definitely fit within the demand growth. You know, you can ask like, well, how come the project's not done yet? Why aren't you under construction? And, and my answer is that, you know, we have demonstrated it's, it's economic. Our investors understand that, our buyers understand that. 
uh, our buyers understand that there's there's or, or, or our buyers understand that they want to take the LNG from it. We don't think we'll have a problem selling LNG. What we're working on now is 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 essentially just developing what I would say is a large and complex project. And it takes time. And there's only a number of companies in the world that can step in and, and do this. Uh, so we've been working kind of deliberately and carefully with, with our pipeline company, the producers and the LNG lead parties. Um, and it's if, if this project doesn't go forward, it's not because it's an uneconomic project or the producers don't want it to go forward. It's because that you know we just couldn't find the alignment. And there's the real risk of that. And it takes a lot of hard work. And we really appreciate um, the support we're getting from this administration, the support we're getting from the producers, uh, as well as the LNG buyers we have there. But it's, it's, it's a long and difficult process to put all the agreements in place to have, you know, between the LNG producers or the, the natural gas producers who've got their own needs and requirements and risk exposure uh, that they're willing to take in terms of the, and then the GTP pipeline and LNG company and the buyers in the state of Alaska. So we're, we're working through that um, systematically. But it is it is a slow process, and we have a direction from our board that they would rather us take our time and do it right than try to move quickly and and you know have some sort of race with press releases and create a lot of excitement. They want us to to move methodically with this. So Nick, in that regard, what's the most next critical milestone or stage gate that you're looking to get to? It's it's finding that LNG lead party. And, and really that LNG lead party is in service of moving into what's called feed, which is front end engineering and design. Um, and under, you know, there's feed means two different things to an IOC, an independent oil company and a project developer. So when this was Exxon uh, Conoco BP led, uh, typically what th these companies do that self fund these projects they are big enough where they can just pay for it themselves. They typically do a very detailed feed where they take, you know, what they call up to 70% design. Um, a developer, you know, that we'd see down in the Gulf Coast where they bring in outside project financing, they do feed to the extent where they can go out and get construction to, uh, or contracts to construct the project and then raise money from that. So they typically go to maybe, say for example, 30% design. So it's a, it's a lower cost feed with developers. And our initial feed plan was developed, kind of led by ExxonMobil, and it's uh, it's very great work, but it's maybe more work than a developer would need to do feed. Um, so really, it's bringing it's you know kind of a roundabout answer is bringing that LNG lead party, get them at the table, and now we have everyone around the table. We've got the producers, uh, we've got the GTP pipeline and LNG lead party, and maybe even buyers, and we can all figure out what level of agreement, what level of commitment from the buyers, what level of commitment from the producers to sell gas. Uh, is needed in order for those developers to put that capital at risk to do feed. And once we get through feed and once we start feed, that's when we can really start in earnest talking with the LNG lead or the LNG buyers about those long-term contracts that'll underpin a $40 billion investment. Um, so that's it. The laser focus is on the LNG lead party in service of entering into feed. So um, with given the fact that it is obviously it's a you know a large scale complex system, it takes a long time. Um, how uh, uh, how how relevant? At, I mean, technology changes over time. Other other things, obviously, your business model has changed over time. Um, with regard to the prior work that's done, how uh, how what's the uh, shelf life of it? How does it maintain relevancy over over this uh, build up period? Uh, again, I'll try to speak like a, a, one of the project manager engineer types. My understanding is that it's, it's incredibly valuable. Um, you know, some of the technology might change, um, but, you know, like for the pipeline, it's, it's still a pipeline. There's been technology change on the pipeline, but the, a lot of the work in terms of the geotechnical, the actual, um, you know, crossings, all that stays, you know, it, it maintains its value on the LNG plant. You know, the marine work is all maintains its value. So there's been over a billion dollars of design work done on this project so far to get where it is. And I would say um, my understanding is most all of it maintains its value. Great. All right. Well, I'll just make uh, one last call for any questions for Nick. Someone has to have some questions about that cost of supply. I'm sure there's still some skeptics on here. <laughs> I'm not seeing any, Nick. It is it is a pretty remarkable reduction, um, and 
I, I don't know if you want to say anything more about it, but uh, uh, it, yeah, it it's, certainly it's, does it certainly does change the you know the potential the outlook for. Here's Ralph. 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 Oh, he's yeah. an economics. Well, well, I mean, this isn't this isn't this isn't the point that the the shift in financing shifts the risk from the uh, project developer onto the buyers, and you have to have buyers who are willing to accept that risk uh, by entering into twenty and well. A, buyers who are willing to take that risk and buyers who have sufficient cap. There are plenty of people out there who will sign a contract like that uh, with the assumption, well, it all goes pop, uh, I'll declare bankruptcy. Uh, and so you've got to have a, a signer who is uh, probably not a third world country, for example. You've got to be selling it to someone who has uh, uh, the, so, so I mean, it's you're reducing the risk of the pro, you're shifting the risk of the project from the developer onto the buyers. It's fundamentally what's going on. Exactly. And you have to have buyers willing to accept, take that risk. Right. That's what we're doing here. Exactly. That's exactly what we're doing. And I would say in 2016, you know, when it was producer led, the model for 50 years before that wasn't to shift all that risk onto them. You know, they 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 had long term contracts, of course, with the producers, but it was linked to oil. It was what they discovered in the U.S. Gulf Coast, which, you know, Sharif Suki and, and, and Michael Smith realized the buyers are willing to accept that risk under these long term take or pay contracts in exchange for a lower price. Um, and again, we're just copying that model and, and we're shifting a little bit more the, the kind of actually I wouldn't even say we're shifting more of the risk. In some ways, we're relieving the risk because, you know, there they take uh, the take or pay risk as well as Henry Hub commodity price risk. Which Henry Hub is is at you know I think four or five dollars right now, and you know in not too recent memory was over ten dollars, uh, so we removed that risk by selling at a stable price, um, and maybe not you know the entire world wants to take long term take or pay stable price risk or take that exposure, um, but we very much expect that enough buyers will take enough of their portfolio and want to, uh, from our pricing mechanism and from our source that that we, you know. Me personally, and I can't guarantee this because we're not out there doing it, but I've got a feeling that once we once we get through feed, once we enter into feed and start having these LNG sales negotiations, I don't think we're going to have a hard time selling 20 MTPA of, of stable priced LNG from the North Pacific. Um, you know, as LNG buyers look around the world and where to source LNG, there's some great sources out there, but they're limited. Um, the U.S. Gulf Coast, you know, we're very supportive of our, of our you know, friends down there, but in order to get to Asia, they've got to go through the Panama Canal. And, and right now, um, from what I understand, President Biden is asking every single one of those Gulf Coast producers to send all their cargoes to Europe to, to, to help you know, our European friends if there's any sort of crisis with, with Russia and the gas supply. Um, so our, our friends in Asia, I think they very much understand that having a US LNG source uh, without the Panama Canal on the Pacific coast is, is very you know, strategically important to them beyond just pricing. But yeah, I know, Ralph, you nailed it on the head. The new business model is to shift the risk to the buyers. But, but you are, you're also saying the producers uh, on the North Slope are going to be prepared to enter into 20-year fixed price uh, contracts so that they will not have the gas price risk? Um, without getting into you know, saying stuff we shouldn't outside uh, confidentiality agreements, I will say that uh, a number of years ago, we just two, three years ago, had binding gas sale precedent agreements with BP and Exxon to buy their gas out of uh, Prudhoe Bay and Point Thompson. Um, and the price uh, that we had in those contracts was, was consistent with, with what we're selling in terms of LNG marketing. Uh, and for the term and volume, that would allow for 20 year SPAs. Oh, man, that's gonna be so yeah, I mean, that's the other side. The, yeah. The, 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 you're, you're, you're telling the buyers that we can get, we can, if, you're, if you'll take, uh, the, the the risk on the value, uh, we can provide more certainty on on the pay price for doing it. Exactly, and and um, you know I think you know we've done some modeling in the past. There might be some room to put some commodity pricing on the North Slope gas price contracts, but but typically no, a, a fixed or stable price um, has been the kind of the basis of our conversation with the producers. Thank you. Jim. Jim, did you have a question? Yes, yeah, so uh, hi, Nick. Uh, very good presentation. Uh, a question for you from the engineering side. Uh, what is the status of the uh, pipeline design 
and the right of way work necessary to get the project going. And let's assume that we're able to put a financing package together. What's the timeline for actually building this thing? Great question. So the timeline to start construction, um, you know, it'll be it'll be dependent. We'd like it to go sooner, but we still have to negotiate the necessary agreements, enter into feed, and perform feed. So um, I think what are we? Let me pull up my timeline so I make sure I'm saying it. Um, so we're looking at potentially entering construction as early as late 2024, 2025. Um, and the right now, kind of the the longest thing to construct would be that gas treatment plant because it requires major sea lifts. From what I understand, the pipeline could be built in two and a half years. That is not the pipeline. That is the 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 long item on the construction schedule. Um, so can't comment too much on the kind of engineering of the pipeline, except for that, that understand that you know we're using a strain based design, and our engineering team and and the pipeline company that's come in and looked at it has you know at this point determined that it's very constructible. Um, and I'll tell you what, the pipeline co company, uh, you, you know, I get to be in a handful of the meeting with their engineers and construction people, and they're excited. An 800 mile pipeline in Alaska, um, we, we have, I think we have, if not all, but um, the majority of our right of way secured, that they're, they're excited. You know, constructing pipelines elsewhere in North America right now is, is challenging because uh, maybe not all the, the, the people along the right of way are supportive of the project. And we certainly can't represent that every single Alaskan is supportive of an 800 mile natural gas pipeline through the state, but the vast majority are supportive. Uh, and I think kind of the, the important reason why is it's moving Alaska's resources through Alaska. We're not moving Alberta's resources through a Midwest state um, that, and that Alaskans have, you know, over 40 years experience with another pipeline taps. And they know what a pipeline can do to the state in terms of jobs and revenue. They know it pays for their roads and schools. And I tell you what, that, that pipeline company is, is, you know, not just from, you know, geeking out as an engineer, like really excited to build it. They're really excited to build a pipeline that is supported by the people uh, who, who, who live around the pipeline route. Um, Nick, we've got just a couple more questions for you. Yeah. Um, uh, Jim Palmer's asking, what do you see as the greatest uh, legal risk for the project? Greatest legal risk. Um, I don't know. That's a good question. You know, we, we, we certainly have legal risks, right? There's, there's um, any big project like that, there's, there's, there's concerns. And we have a couple of outstanding uh, challenges to our export license that um, from what I understand, we're, you know, the, the answers that, that they're asking or the, the answers to the questions they're asking are actually making the project a lot more, you know, stronger, you know, with a better ESG message and better commercial message. So I'm not sure that that'd be a, that'd be a tough one. I think kind of compared to other projects, I think we are, have, very strong permits and very defensible permits. Um, so I'm not seeing a major legal risk though, though they, they, they're they always out there. And that's why we have Lisa Haas, who I think is the best out there to helping keep our permit. Right. Well, there, there always are going to be more hurdles and I'm probably, yeah. uh, um, I, I suspect like we've seen with lots of projects that sometimes they come from unexpected quarters. So, um, Nick, we also have um, um, David Dinkenberger on with us, and he's asking, what if you essentially flip the processing equation where you make the LNG on the North Slope, put that in the pipeline um, instead of the compressed gas and then uh, making LNG in, in uh, South Central? Yeah, the, you know, the, 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 the big issue with that is that the LNG is at negative 250. And the cryogenic steel needed to handle that is it would make that prohibitively expensive. Um, so that's why you generally see the, the you know, shortest LNG pipe as possible from the LNG plant to the storage tank to the marine jetty. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not something you want to move around too much in liquid form. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, it, that looks like all of the questions that we have in chat, and I don't see anybody else popping in. I did want to tell you that uh, I'm not sure if Marianne's still on the phone with us, but uh, she's had some connectivity issues. Uh, uh, Prospect Heights, I think, is where she is. So some, sometimes not the great, uh, greatest connectivity. But at any rate, she sends her appreciation and uh, regrets that she wasn't be able to be with us the full time, but she was listening in. And uh, Bernie, do you have any closing remarks that you wanted to offer? Uh, 
Uh, no, I, I thought you did a very good job, Nick, and I really uh, I think you uh, you and your corporation are on the right move. And it looks like uh, uh, things are going to look like they're lining. The stars are kind of lining up for you. And uh, best best the work up to uh, your hard work. And uh, you're right about uh, your other uh, people that are working on there. There are some really dedicated uh, uh, Alaskans that are working on this project, and I appreciate it. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, Bernie, and and thanks thanks for the audience here. Um, you know, we understand this project's been kicked around a long time. There's been times where we put it in the newspapers and try to get everyone really enthusiastic and excited. And, and I think you know what we'd really like is just kind of continued engagement. You know, support from Alaskans. Uh, we're, we'll try to be very clear with you on you know where the project's at and the reality of it. And, and the reality is, it's a, it's a great project, but it still has a long ways to go and a lot of work to do. And you know. Appreciate, appreciate you guys' support. Any, any questions you guys have, feel free to reach back out. You know, we're doing this for Alaskans and we'll take all the time in the world to, 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 to talk with you guys as, as you want. Great, well, thank, thank you again, Nick. We appreciate your time and uh, sharing the information with us today. Uh, just for everybody online, we will post the recording for this event later. You'll receive an email notification for that along with a copy of Nick's slide deck. Next week, we do have um, Lee Thiebert with Chugach Electric Association who will be joining us. Uh, so encourage you uh, to register for that session as well. And I'll include the registration link in the follow-up email. And with that, um, I, again, thanks, Nick. Uh, all good things in time and uh, always best to work on the project fundamentals and prove it up. Uh, hopefully uh, that will lead to some success in the future. And, you know, obviously, I think you've illustrated for us today that um, not only from the natural gas standpoint, but the potential for uh, hydrogen conversion is uh, a, a really important aspect of the project. So we appreciate that. All right, everybody. Uh, happy Friday. Friday, as we like to say, and hope you have a good weekend. Take good care. Mm -hmm.